The next topic that we're going to look at are volumes of revolution. And the idea behind it is if you have some curve, y equals f of x, and you take that curve and rotate it 360 degrees about an axis, you create a solid. And if you had two curves, and you took the area between those two curves and then rotated it, you would get another solid. So the item on the right there looks like a bell. And we're going to be able to use our calculus to now find volumes that you could never find before. But to start off with, there is a famous mathematical problem called Gabriel's horn. Gabriel's horn, please, you just take your 1 over x graph. Say you started at 1 goes on forever. You know how your 1 over x graph has an asymptote at 0? And if I took this, and rotated it 360 degrees about the x-axis, I would make a horn. A horn with an infinite length, and it has some very weird properties. Okay. Little story behind it there. Now, the weird thing about Gabriel's horn is that it goes off to infinity. So weird things happen at infinity. You can actually figure out the volume of Gabriel's horn. So that means if you can figure out the volume, even though it goes on forever, if you can figure out the volume, means that you could fill it full of paint. There's a certain amount of paint that would fill in Gabriel's horn. So now you've got this very long infinite horn. It'd be hard to get to the top of it to get the paint out. But then you decide you'd like to paint the outside of the horn with the paint that's on the inside. And this is where this problem has a bit of a paradox. The surface area of this shape is infinite. So even though you can fill it full of paint, you can't paint the outside, which blows the mind, because while it's filled, is it not technically touching the whole inside? Which, if it's paper thin, should be equivalent to the, oh my gosh. There are some weird things that happen in mathematics when you play around with infinity. But what we're going to be doing is finding out how to figure out these volumes. And we're going to do it with the same way that you figured out areas of curves. When we wanted to find the area under this curve f of x, do you remember that we just, like we did our Riemann sums and got little tiny rectangles? And we made those rectangles so tiny that they were almost basically straight lines. Now, if you took each of those tiny rectangles and rotated 360 degrees, what shape would you make? You'd make a perfect circle. A circle with the radius that was the area or that rectangle under the curve. Well, we can find all of those areas, right? If I wanted to find the area of one of those circles, it would be pi r squared. And pi r squared, well, the radius would just be the length of f of x. Then if we took all of those radiuses and added them up, that would be the area under the curve. If we took all of those radiuses, added them up, and made them circle, the integral from a to b will be adding up all of those disks and give us the volume of that solid. This is called the disk method. And when we subtract two, as we see in the picture of the bell on the right-hand side, 
When we subtract two functions and rotate that, each cross section makes a washer or a donut. And if you added up all of those washers, you would get the volume of that shape. And that's called the washer method. So what we're doing in the second part of this unit is seeing how we can use our areas under curves to turn them into volumes. And what happens when we rotate objects around the x-axis? What happens when we rotate around the y-axis? Or maybe you want to rotate around a different axis and see what that looks like. So the disk method formula, okay, and these are not hard to remember because they're just based on circles. You know the area of a circle is pi r squared. So the disk method said do pi r squared, but your radius is going to be whatever your y value of your function is. Same thing with the washer method. What we're doing is we're taking the one disk and subtracting the other disk. So we're having two circles. And with the washer method, sometimes we like to think of the outer radius and the inner radius. So you'll see this sometimes written instead of f of x and g of x. You have your bigger radius minus your smaller radius. And again, this is really nice because you can really see the pi r squared idea coming through. So we can also do this by partitioning the y-axis, right? You know that you could find area under a curve with your y-axis. So if you rotated that 360 degrees, you would get a bunch of circles. And any time, like here at the end, there's a circle. Here's the circle at the end here. You could take any point in the middle there and you would get all of your cross sections would be circles. So we can do the same thing with our y-axis with both the disk method and the washer method. We use A and B when we find our x coordinates. When we're partitioning the x-axis, when we're partitioning the y-axis, we like to use C and D, just so we're saying we're using new letters. But the idea is exactly the same. And you can do the outer radius minus the inner radius as well. Was that good? Is everybody done? Oh, no. <laughs> so again, you can tell which one you're going to use if it says it's rotated around the x-axis or if it's rotated around the y. These ones with the dy are all ones that would be rotated around the y-axis.
So find the volume of the solid that is generated when the region under the x cube graph from 1 to 2 is rotated about the y-axis. So first of all, here I'll show you how I go about drawing this. I would take my x cube graph. I want to rotate it from 1 to 2. So I would know that I have the point 1, 1, and up here 2, 8. When drawing this, and it gets rotated about the x-axis, the first thing I would do is I would take a point and down here, also label 1, negative 1, and the 2, 8, I would label down here at 2, negative 8. Whatever this distance is, replicate it down below. I'm going to draw my shape in purple. So around this one, make an oval. That sort of gives you the idea of a circle in three dimensions. And do the same oval in that shape. Then to really see the 3D object as easy as possible. Some people only shade one part. I'm going to take out my fancy crayons here. I'm going to shade this part in, in red, I'm going to shade the rest of this in purple. By shading the one part, this is sort of like, you see this circle, but you wouldn't see that back circle as part of the object. Shading it in sometimes helps you visualize the shape of it best. And I guess you can decide which circle, like in two dimensions before the shading is there. I'm going to go back before the shading is there. Some people like to see it this way. And you can choose. If you want to say, I see this circle, but I don't see this one. Do you like that better? Do you like seeing, just depends which way in three dimensions you're looking at it. But when you just draw the circles in two dimensions, it's hard to picture that as much. So there's our solid. We now want to find, what is the volume of this? So we're going to take our pi r squared from 1 to 2 which gives us an x to the 6th graph. And I especially like these ones where we can do the mental math. 127 divided by 7 pi units cubed. That's great. Now it looks like a piece of ham. Right before lunch, you're getting hungry.
So our square root graph is rotated from 1 to 5. Finding that volume, again, it's just pi r squared. It's adding up all of those circles from 1 to 5. All of these integrals are super easy. And the volume of that ham is exactly 8 pi units cubed. We can start doing some very cool things. For example, do you remember the formula for the volume of a cone? One of the formulas you needed to have memorized for like related rate questions. Do you remember it? What's, what's the volume of a cone? One third pi r squared times height, right? You got it? You remembered it? You remember one third. That's the most important part, right? Because it's just technically, if you drew the whole cylinder, the cone is exactly one third of that cylinder. So the formula we memorized. Well, let's say you forgot the formula, but you happen to remember your volumes of revolutions perfectly. You're like, I can't remember a simple volume formula, but I remember how to do volumes of revolution, what would be the volume of this shape if we go from 0 to h as my height and have just the radius as my y value? Well, what does that look like? First of all, I would say my volume would be from 0 to h and then I need to make this in terms of x, okay? So we've got to do a little bit of thinking here. How do we make my radius in terms of x and look at this triangle right here? So this is always... always our radius there, that's always our height. What is the relationship between those two? And how can we rewrite this as r over h times x squared? Right? This line right here is a straight line. It is a straight line with a slope of r over h and a y-intercept of 
of 0. So I can write an equation for that black line as y equals r over hx plus 0. And that's my f of x. That's my y coordinate is always going to be r over h times whatever the x coordinate is. And then we can take that and plug that in to the equation there. So now I've got my integral set up. I want to find the volume of revolution from 0 to h. Here's my y function, my f of x, f of x gets squared. Multiply things out. Now the r squared over h squared, those are constants. Those are just numbers. We're creating a formula, so we're keeping them as r and h, but you could bring them out in front of your integral. And then our integral is just x squared. What's really cool about this is when you integrate that, you get your x cubed over 3. That's where your 1 third comes out in your formula. Plugging in h, you and your h cubed and your h squared simplifies. And so we can use volumes of revolutions to verify where the formula comes from. So it would be interesting to see a history of the development of this formula. Because before calculus was invented, discovered, however you want to describe it, volumes of cones were known. This formula was known. A mathematician came up with that formula without calculus. Now we develop calculus, and I can say that this way of developing the formula is quite easy. If you have the complicated calculus and all of those ideas first, then we create our formula this way. It's quite easy. But for every formula that's out there, I think a squared plus b squared equals c squared is probably has the record. I think there's over a, over 100 different proofs of different ways you can show that that one's true. So mathematicians would be like, here's another way to show the volume of a cone. You can look online to see what other proofs are out there. Okay? A really nice, simple proof is you make a cylinder and a cone. You fill the cone of water, pour it into the cylinder. Do that three times, it fills up. You're like, perfect. This is one third. So we had this question before of sine x and cos x. Here, I'll draw it out bigger for you. So the blue graph is my sine graph, the black graph is my coast graph. We know that they intersect here. At pi over 4, comma root 2 over 2. So if I wanted to draw this rotation, what I would do is I would measure out or sort of flip both of these graphs. So here's my post graph flip. There's my sine graph flip. Between these two, I draw a circle. an oval between those two. 
take out my crayon. So this is going to be the washer method. What it means is that if I take any area between these two curves, like this red part here, draw a circle around that part, that would also make this red part down here, and I would rotate that. It would make a solid washer. And so we can imagine, I always imagine this one, take that, or just take the red away for a second, as like a water dish for dogs turned on its side. The green part that's shaded is the outside, the paint is the outside green. And then inside here is going to be open, so you can put water in. Technically, this isn't the best design, there's a tiny pinhole right at the bottom, but small enough that no molecule of water can get through, so it's okay. So can we visualize a water dish for a dog on its side this way? The opening is going to be where the blue line is, that's going to be an open part. Thank you. And now we want to, we love our dog. And so it's our dog's birthday. We want to build this dog dish out of something platinum, titanium, something really expensive, gold. And you want to find out how much gold do you have to buy, what volume do you need in order to make this dog dish. So we have our outer radius minus our inner radius. I'll put this up so it's on the video, but we'll finish it up next time.